This program is made possible in part by the Maryland Arts Council through the State of Maryland and the National Endowment for the Arts and the Howard County Arts Council through a grant from Howard County Government. Welcome to Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life, and I'm Tara Betts here with Terrence Hayes. Hi, Tara. So, how, how you, you doing, doing, Terrence? It's good to see you. I'm pretty good. How you been? I'm good. I'm good. I'm yeah, so yeah. excited to be sitting here with you and getting ready to have a great conversation about poetry. I so know. Ark and Hugh came out in 2009, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I wondered if you talk a little bit about the process for writing the book. Well, most of the poems in the book are probably the things that I wrote when I was still in my MFA program at New England College. Uh, some of them are earlier poems and some of them are poems that I wrote uh, when I started teaching at Rutgers University. So it's kind of like a mix of these elements where I thought about what we remember and the nostalgia that's kind of left behind, the vestiges of that. How do you kind of retrace those spaces in memory that are you know, that come back to us again and again. Sometimes we're kind of obsessed with them. Yeah. You know? I think of you as a, a family poet, a poet of intimacy. Would you, do you think of yourself that way? At times, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I think of um, some of the poems touch on family, but then what is family? It's mm -hmm. like sometimes to me it comes out like a more extended community of people who find things in common with emotional threads that come back to certain things, sure. you know? So it can be blood, but it's not always blood, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Well, how would you define your poetics? I mean, you seem uh, like you have such a broad range of influences. I see you come back to a lot of classics like Robert Hayden and sure. Baraka, you know, but then it's like you'll do stuff like the anagram poems and hip logic right. or, you know, just even that longer narrative thrust that kind of comes up and went in the box. Sure. Well, even to mention Robert Hayden, who's a Midwestern poet, yeah. very classical, thick, thick glasses. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think of as ele ele elegant, but not everyone else does. And then there's Baraka, mm -hmm. the black arts poet with the dashikis and the afros and sort of flamboyant. Mm -hmm. And I, I like the space between the two of them. I've right. never wanted to affiliate myself exclusively with either the kind of quiet, meditative poet or the political social poet. So for mm -hmm. me, I want to wed those two identities. And so that's my approach to the work. So even in Lighthead, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, there are poems that are, there's poems about Tupac Shakur, but there are also poems about Fela Kuti and meeting my father. So for me, I'm just trying to, to yeah. not stay in one space too long. I know. I think that's the beauty too of a lot of contemporary poets is that they're not seeing these divisions of what we can and can't talk about sure. in the same ways or what forms or shapes that we have permission to use in our poems. Right. And that's so important. I know I always think of narrative poems as being kind of the place where I felt really comfortable. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, how can I break that comfort? And that's kind of what drew me into poetic form. Well, what have you been doing to break um, the comfort? Well, I tried, I've tried different forms. You know, I really... Actually, there's a book that I love that you mentioned like in a passing conversation years ago. It was uh, an, an Exaltation of Forms. Sure, yeah. Anne and Finch. I go back to that book again and again. I have a dog-eared copy of it. Mm -hmm. um, but then I also thought about compression and how valuable it is to say something in a really condensed space. So I've been looking at Kwanzaa's, the Eugene Redmond form, mm -hmm. um, going back to haiku on occasion, but also just saying, you know, how can we work with the short line, mm -hmm. you know, which is one of the things that I've always loved about Clifton. Right. You know, and then, too, you're doing, I cannot pronounce the form. Well, there's many Lighthead. titles. Picha Kucha is yeah. like picture, picture. So mm -hmm. it's like these 20-part poems, and mm -hmm. they are a clip. So it's interesting to think about compression because yeah. each section of the 20-part poem takes about 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. But really, the reason that I got into it was because of its duration. I wanted to try to write. Mm -hmm. long poems and so now I can't stop I've just started thinking about how do I get back to compression but my yeah. impulse is to expand I think yeah. of poems just sort of opening and opening 
as opposed to kind of like that kind of tight image, mm -hmm. the loose, long, associative line is what excites me. Um, yeah, and then too, you think about poems being in conversation with each other or linking to each other, and right. that's exciting to me too. Sure, you yeah, know? yeah. So, so at some point, I think we should hear some work. Are you gonna Are you gonna share a poem with us? I'd love to share a poem. Are you gonna share a poem later? I might. Or maybe I could read one. You could read one. Yeah. I would like that. Okay, let's All do right. it. Um, I'll read a new poem. Oh, great. So great. as you can see, I have my little manuscript pages. Yeah, this um, is exciting. That's are always you still the fun on the part. page. Are you still changing it? How are you thinking about these poems? Are they um, done? I think this one this longer one is almost done okay so we'll see where it goes i've been playing a lot with different phrases that use the word white uh. and thinking about how they play out in different ways right. so this is the main poem i think it's called the white album okay i'm listening to beetles as afternoon light shifts through stalwart off-white vertical blinds a dim reflection on the apartment's white walls the white refrigerator breaks through multi-track caterwauls that eerily echo the blues once plucked from ivories and guitars by not-so-white hands. Then there is the white mother who raised me, a clear imprint of my own face when I put down my pen and look into the mirror mounted in my white bathroom. I wash my face and hands, amble to the kitchen's white tiles where I open the white refrigerator, stare at the soy milk and heavy whipping cream, graham crackers, chocolate, to create a forced integration that most people enjoy. Consume with white teeth, savor, crunch. I open a window. A flashback recalls John, Paul, George, and Ringo claiming their shaggy rebellions to swoons of white girls collapsing before crashing into white crosswalks and curbs. The young women imagine white thighs parted for a white eruption arching into white constellations. They fathom nostalgia of the white bedroom curtains drift in the, sh in the window the next morning, wearing nothing but a pop star's white shirt. It is white collar labor to hone such images. When I grew up later among tops rolling papers, crisp white squares like the larger line pages of a notebook turned into portal. As the double album moves from the first disc to another, the white dough of realization rises fast because I've been listening to the white album all my life, thrown back into my sight insistent as sunlight thrown against crisp snow, omnipresent, so it never has to imagine anything outside itself. Yet each note borrows and lives off my honeysuckle, white petals crushed. Each song shoves its way into my ears with voices deeper, older, and paler than mine, filled with a milk that clouds the music of everyone's sky, including its own. Ooh, great, so. great. Now I could talk for another 30 minutes about that poem. I love like the white starts to just pop through it, you know, when mm -hmm. you hear it and the word just sort of lights up, at least in my, mm -hmm. my crazy mind. I like the Ringo and window coming through it. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, and I think this is one of the really difficult things to do in poems is to how to offer a critique and also offer something like affection. So mm -hmm. there's affection for the music, but there's also a kind of implicit critique, uh, not even implicit, yeah. uh, of like what the word means and how the word sort of infiltra infiltrates the culture. Mm -hmm. That's good. So that's going to be in your next book. I hope so, yeah. And it's really interesting because I think about how we have cer certain words that we just come back to again yeah, and yeah, again, right? Yeah. How do we try to challenge and put those words on their ears in different ways? Which is one of the things that always brings me back to looking at your poems. Because you'll poke at things and kind of say, I'm going to make fun of this a little bit. Yeah, well, that's what I'm about to do here. And uh, it's because you have the white, so I'm going to do the black. <laughs> I haven't read this poem in a minute. It's, uh, it's the Blue Seuss. And you know, uh, also something that you're uh -huh. doing in that poem is something that I've been trying to do because I think of myself as a little bit, to what page this is on, a little bit uh, obsessive compulsive. Mm -hmm. And so I really like to repeat. And if anybody really looked closely at my poems, what they would discover is that this dude just says the same thing again and again and again. So I try to complicate that. Mm -hmm. And so what I hear in that poem and what I'm gonna be thinking about mm -hmm. when I sit down later, is how to like, so you are doing repetition, essentially. You are, mm -hmm. the word is just streaming through it, but you're coming at it with these various little fragments of narrative, so. Yeah. But this is what I do, really, most of the time. So this is the Blue Seuss. Mm -hmm. 
is Seuss thinking about, you know, race. Yeah. Blacks in one box, blacks in two box, blacks on blacks stacked in boxes, stacked on boxes, blacks in boxes stacked on shores, blacks in boxes stacked on boats in darkness, blacks in boxes do not float. Blacks in boxes count their losses. Blacks on boat docks, blacks on auction, blacks on wagons, blacks with masters in the houses, blacks with bosses in the fields, blacks in helmets toting rifles, blacks in Harlem toting banjos, boots and quilts, blacks on foot, blacks on buses, blacks on backwood, hardwood stages singing blues, blacks on Broadway singing too. Blacks can Charleston, blacks can foxtrot, blacks can bebop, blacks can moonwalk, blacks can beatbox, blacks can run fast too. <laughs> blacks on blacks and blacks on knees and blacks on couches, blacks on good times, blacks on roots, blacks on Cosby. Blacks in voting booths are blacks in boxes. Blacks beside blacks in rows of houses are blacks in boxes too. Hmm. So that's one from Wind in the Box, which was the book before yeah. Lighthead. You know. And I know it just always makes me think how, and maybe this is a good question to just pose to you. How do you find yourself taking these really serious topics and then finding a way to posit them in something that has something that makes you smirk? It's like sure. a little touch of humor. It's uh -huh. just not over the top. Right. You know? Oh, that's probably personality. You know, I have these theories about, uh, well, things like style, like mm -hmm. what is a poet's style? Because yeah. I think poets should resist style. I think artists should resist style and try to do something new okay. at each venture. Mm -hmm. Because one thing, style is just implicit to what you do. You know, it's a style of breathing, style of walking. Mm -hmm. And also because like the sort of commercial idea of style is that it helps you sell a product. Mm -hmm. But my style is that, like in my family, you know, my children and my wife and in my family, my parents and my brother, I was the person who would always sort of you know, bring a little bit of levity to the gravity. Mm -hmm. So I think that's just implicit in my personality. So what becomes interesting to me as a writer is how to sort of, like, can I be serious? That's sort of what I ask myself, if that yeah. makes sense. So because I'm resisting style, if I think my natural habit is to be like a trickster and mm -hmm. joker. So I think when I'm sitting down to work, how to sort of push through that. And, and you'll see like some of the poems uh, in Lighthead are in fact fairly serious. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm going after. I'm trying not to do the thing that comes natural to me. Yeah, it is a very different tone from Wind in a Box. Right. Like, I keep thinking of the poem with the fish, and um, what is the title? Is it Carp Poem? There's, and there's Fish the Head. The Carp Poem. I got with, a bunch of fish yeah, all through the book. It's the one where you're visiting, or rather that's, the speaker is visiting right. the prison. That's Carp Poem. Yeah. And I thought, that's such a dynamic way to write about a subject that people have written about in a lot right. of poems. Sure. But then to hit it from talking about these fish that would not be there in the first place, right. right? Yeah. So you're like, oh, how do we make that happen? Yeah. How do we make those associations? That always gets me excited too, thinking right. about how poets jump from something that seems completely unrelated into something that is yeah. and in you're, their you're, mind. You're doing that, I think, in the White Album. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, underneath this question is that question of like, how are you challenging yourself as you move into book two? Do you have a title? For the book? Um, How far along are you? I in thought about book? making it the White Album. I may cool. change that. Um, right. And then I had this, it's funny, after this, Ark and Hugh, I started just writing a lot of random things. Right. So I have a lot of these short poems that are thematically linked to the number seven. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it may be a project called Seven Times Seven yeah. and this other one with the poems like the one I read. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that is the question on top of that, like right? the next project. It is, how are you challenging yourself? How are you? Uh, conceiving of the new mm -hmm. book so you right now it's still disparate you're just like writing whatever yeah you're going. like I feel like I have those two veins and then I'm also writing disparate poems I'm mm -hmm. writing prose things that I thought I would never do in prose so that's right. really exciting to me too mm -hmm. but it's just a matter of me as you know it's the problem all writers have making yourself sit down at the desk and do it yeah so yeah. after you've talked to your students and dealt with your family right. and you know whatever you have to do to uh -huh. live yeah, of course, you know, I think the, the thing that is not always clear to us when we're starting out, when we're MFA students and, mm -hmm. and, and teachers, is like the open-endedness of writing. Yeah. So for me, like I, I have this poem, and may, I've just been calling it the magic poem. It's sort of about Magic Johnson, but it also is about like black magic and notions of magic. And I think I've been working on that thing since, you know, February, maybe. Yeah. So every night I go up and I wrestle it, and I think tonight, I thought this, you know, two nights ago, I thought, oh, mm -hmm. I've, I've done it. And every night, my wife's a writer, 
-hmm. So uh, when I wake up in the morning, I say, oh, I think I did it. I think I did it. It's done. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing this since February, you know, mm -hmm. at least every other night. So part of that is very exciting to not know, like, mm -hmm. is it going to be the White Album? What is this right. work going to be? And that's exciting to me. And again, mm -hmm. this is sort of a, it separates how people think of what we do. They think, yeah. I think we have a lot more control than in fact we do. That uncertainty is a huge part of you know. the writing life and the part of sort of understanding next projects. Yeah, and then too, it's like your obsession. It's like, do you decide when your obsession ends, when you sit down and write? I don't think you can sometimes. It's right. like, no, I'm not done with you yet. Yeah. You know, which brings us back to that whole idea of the muse. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like it's going to come when it feels like, but sometimes the discipline has to intercede, you know. That's so right. it's like That's a right. balance and tension between the two. Yeah. I know. I think people think of the muse as, a, uh, you know, this beauty that's singing in your ear, but I think it's a fight. It's yeah. always a fight. It's a little to, insistent. To get her to show up, and then when she shows up, <laughs> we're wrestling because she says, I want you to write about. Do you know, it this name way. It. Write about music. You know, you <laughs> like music. And I'm like, no, no, I want to write about magic. <laughs> No, and so now we're fighting and again like I, I sort of think this idea of between this you know that's what a yeah. metaphor is like my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun it's mm -hmm. not about the sun or the mistress's eyes it's like that yeah right on that little bridge where they meet mm -hmm. so that's my relationship to the muse like we're gonna fight and something will happen it'll be a little baby you know that won't be the muse and it won't be me it'll just be, be something. crying and upset that's right that's right <laughs> and then you'll train it up and then say yeah. okay this is how you're gonna behave and send the baby out in the world the poem Exactly. And then sometimes it comes home because everybody hates it. Mm. Like your baby ain't got no manners. <laughs> it's it ill-behaved. Yeah, it might become a doctor or a president. You don't know when you send it yeah. out. But you know what? I've been curious because I was, of course, I was revisiting your books yeah. after I came here. Um, I was thinking about, since you have four books out and they've come out, what would you say it's it hasn't quite been 10 years since you published your the first, first one was 99 first yeah. one muscular music came out in 1999 so it's a little bit more than 10 right but to have four books in that period of time um how do you think your thinking changed from one book to the next uh, that's a good that's question what i'm always curious about yeah, i just sort of think now this will sound sort of uh well, I think, I think many poets, I think Baraka, I think Lucille Clifton are poets who, again, it's, it goes back to style, right? Like, mm -hmm. they're just growing. They're just having kids and they're yeah. getting jobs and they're meeting people and they're just trying to, like, be better today than mm -hmm. they were yesterday. So that's really my ambition. So for me, if I just say that one thing, I don't want to repeat myself. That's enough. And so yeah. that gets me going from one day to the next. But the style changes as I hope I change. Like, if my poems are the same, that really means... I haven't been really yeah. challenging I kinda myself. I kind of feel like that you know? too. Yeah. So I hope you know. it grows out of, uh, you know, I, 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 say, I say this to my students, that the poem is always first. And this is the thing that, you know, when you're talking to kids who are doing like um, spoken word. Mm -hmm. um, and I say, well, you know, it's really not about the poet because the poet lives and dies. It always has to be about the poem. You got to yeah. make this thing that's going to kind of keep on walking when mm -hmm. you're done walking. So I always have to sort of say, well, I got to put everything that's real in the poem. So like mm -hmm. the fears of like, oh, you know, I'm getting ready to turn 40, or, you know, do I, why hasn't my father called me? Or, mm -hmm. you know, why can't I do math? Those kind of basic questions that, you know, you wake up with. Irritations about politics. Yeah. Irritations with black people and white people and everything else in the world. Just people. Yeah, yeah. and so like yeah. letting those, and love, you know, letting yeah. those things sort of inform the work. So for me, and maybe this is naive, but I sort of feel like if I'm pushing myself, yeah, it's and then gonna feed change. that to the feed that to the poem, the poems will change, and they'll yeah. I often themselves. I think about that a lot because um, there are poems I feel like I could write now that I would not have written ten sure, years ago. Sure, that's right. And I look at some of my students sometimes, and I'm like, oh gosh, I see you're in that phase. Uh, and part of me wants to be very hands off and be like, okay, work through that. I want you to just go and read this and uh -huh. then I'll give them a couple books and say, let's come back and talk. Because I just know that that was the process that kind of worked for me. Yeah. But what about the inverse of that? What about those poems that you wrote then that you can't write now? Yeah. That's where I sort of am now. Like, can you talk about that? Those early mm -hmm. poems that you were, is there any kind of magic that you feel like you've lost over the years? Or, well, or it's been transformed, loss is so negative. I would say, well, Sometimes it does feel like loss. It's kind of traumatic to know you're this different person. Yeah, yeah. And to see what you were thinking, how could you kind of examine it through another lens? And I always think about that. Like, if I could rewrite this poem that I did, right. that people, you know, sometimes they're poems that people love, and you look at them and you're like, 
oh, I could have yeah, did this better. Sure, sure. I want to do something different, yeah. you know, take a different voice, right. a different how, line. How many of your earlier poems make it into Ark and You? Do you feel, I mean, because I'm not going to say, oh, read a poem that's embarrassing, but. No, 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 no. I think maybe there were like two or three at least. At least two. I know mm -hmm. there's definitely two. Right. And I put those in because those were poems that, again, people always came back to. Uh, one of them was switched that I was really proud of because, sure. not because it's just the first poem I wrote at Cave Count, which right. was where we met. Yeah, yeah. Um, but because it borrowed from a form in Lucille Clifton's The Book of Light. It's uh -huh. not a fixed form that we learn that's received, right. but it's the poem Move, mm -hmm. where she writes about Move organization and the bombing in Philly in 1985. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I was just so, other than the content of the poem, the way she shifted in these really concise lines right. from one image, then it was the, this two word refrain, then it would go into the next really concise image. And uh -huh. it told you the whole story. And I was like, I want to do that. Right. You know, so it kind of really got me thinking about how to shape a poem and make it say something. And it's something that always speaks to people. Now, I wonder I if we're going to have time to hear that one. Because, you know, you said a bunch of stuff there. Lucille Clifton and also Cave Canem, which mm -hmm. is where I first met Lucille Clifton. Yeah. Cave Canem, the re retreat for African-American writers that's been going on. 16 years now, I yeah. think. And so did you meet her there or did you have any overlap with her you know, at that retreat? I actually met her in, I think it was 1998. Mm, and mm. she had encouraged me to apply for Cave oh, great. Yeah. You know, and then every time she came to Chicago, I was like, do you need me to go get anything, Miss Clifton? Yeah. So she kind of felt like, and I'm sure tons of people could say this, she was like a mother figure. Sure. Yeah. And not just in that corny kind of, oh, Elderly women are always our mothers, but she right. would tell you the real talk. Oh, yeah, no, she and was be fierce. Grounded. I thought she was deaf. I was a little yeah. bit afraid of her. Really? Because yeah. I'm not afraid of my mom. Oh, she's sweet. I'm a little intimidated, fire. but that's separate. <laughs> a fear and intimidation. But I was like, oh, wow, you know, it's just this force. So, yeah. But there's nurture in that, that force that she brought. Definitely. So, what do you think? I think I can. We'll close with that. Right? Yeah. For we'll sure. see where we're going. I just couldn't remember the page, so let me check really quick. Okay. So, it's on page 31. Okay. Switch, and it starts with a quote from Nas. Typical day that a black girl sees coming home wanting more from a college degree. Nas, black girl lost. Crush the corning of gloss and glory glides across her lips. She looks in the mirror, puckers, pops her gum, knows what would happen if mama saw her switch, girl. Bounce, bounce song scripts, pinned into rivets of denim, pressed into thighs, rocking Tupac is shorts cause she can switch, girl. Purveyors of pulp nonfiction sit on regals with chrome rims, mocking constellations, and damn her pelvic metronome. Switch, girl. A poet sketches what he imagines as her fantasies behind his microphone. He pastes her into fables of sexual favors for handbags, haphazardly stitches her walk into crack alleys, half tapes her barely breathing body with bruises. Switch, girl. Women sit facing the microphone. Their pupils spin full circles. The girl is each one of them when she hands the peri periodic table of elements next to cutouts from right on. She just wanted to be a nurse or just get an A in chemistry quietly while looking like doing something she ain't. Girl, switch. Wow, that was great. And that reminds me that my wife has your book. We've had your book in our house for a long time and I've never gotten it because she has it. But it reminds me of Switch, which is what you do in the White Album, that combination of like these images of women, even mm -hmm. though you're weaving it into Nas, the language and the, the figure, the switching figure to mm -hmm. me is, has this kind of like female quality to it that I think is why my wife just, yeah. I'm gonna have to steal it out of the room when I go back home. Yeah. Well, I hope it has that quality of motion and movement, yeah. which also reminds me of your poem, Carp, mm -hmm. where you have people stepping and then there are fish. Would you like to share that with us? Sure. I'd love to I'd hear it. I'd be happy to read it. I also think connected to that, that you know, the men in the poems uh, as a sort of, these men in this tight space trying not to move or trying to figure out how they're gonna move yeah. in that space. Mm -hmm. So this is a cart poem. It's one sentence. After I have parked below the spray paint caked 
into the granite grooves of the Frederick Douglass Middle School sign where men-sized children loiter like shadows draped in outsized denim, jerseys, braids, and boots that mean I am no longer young. After I have made my way to the New Orleans Paris jail down the block where the black prison guard wears the same weariness my prison guard father wears buzzes me in. I follow his pistol and shield along each corridor, trying not to look at the black men boxed and bunked around me until I reach the tiny classroom where two dozen black boys are dressed in jumpsuits, orange as the carp I saw in a pond once in Japan. So many fat, snaggletooth fish ganged in and lurching for food that a lightweight tourist could have crossed the water on their backs, so long as he had tiny rice balls or bread to drop into the mouths below his footstep, which I'm thinking is how Jesus must have walked on the lake that day, the crackers and crumbs falling from the folds of his robe, and how maybe it was the one fish so hungry it leapt up his sleeve that he later miraculously changed into a narrow loaf of bread, something that could stick to a believer's ribs. And don't get me wrong, I'm a believer too, in the power of food at least, having seen a footbridge of carp packed gill to gill, packed tighter than a room of boy prisoners waiting to talk poetry with a young black poet, packed so close they'd have eaten each other if there'd been nothing else to eat. Mm. Yeah, such a great sense of movement. I mean, it goes from the color of the, the uniforms into the fish gathering and huddling and then the boys gathering and huddling. Yeah. So it's like, isn't that what poets are doing? We're kind of jumping from one thing to the next. I hope that's what we're doing. Thanks for sharing, Tara. This is great. It was really wonderful to be with you today. Really great to be with you too. You know, hopefully we'll do it again sooner. I hope so. This is Tara Betts. I'm Terrence Hayes. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Hoko Polizzo's The Writing Life. <laughs> Thank you.